Hi, I'm John Harris. For 17 years, I've made my living here at Chesapeake Lifecraft as a designer and builder of lightweight kayaks, rowing boats, and sailboats. Occasionally, I get off script and do something wacky, but related. If I have a mission, it's to persuade people who love boats to do more with less. My latest project, the 31-foot proa that I've named Madness, is a study in how much sailboat you can get for the least amount of time and money. This is not my first adventure with proas. A proa is simply an outrigger sailing canoe, a twin-hulled sailboat with one big hull and one little hull. In the 1990s, I designed and built a 20-foot proa named Mbulu, which is Swahili for madness. This was a successful little beach cruiser, quite a few of which have been built now. I was about 25 years old and did a series of dumb kid things of mine, including hoisting way too much sail area. Anyway, that was a while ago, and the advantages of proas for sailing enthusiasts who care about efficiency continue to be an itch I can't stop scratching. Let me tell you why. If you want an efficient hull, make it narrow. That's simple. There's just no resistance through the water. And in my opinion, the purest expression of efficiency in a boat is a kayak. If you're as lazy as I am, once you get tired of paddling, you start thinking about adding a sail to your kayak. But, of course, kayaks haven't enough stability for real sailing. So we take our narrow kayak hull and we add outriggers. Now we have a trimaran. Once you scale this design up to include cruising accommodations, suddenly everything is pretty complicated. First of all, keeping three hulls sailing together in close formation is not a trivial engineering challenge. These cross beams are subjected to massive dynamic loads as the three hulls work through waves. What this means to someone building a boat in their backyard is a lot of advanced composite boat building. Unless you use railroad ties as cross beams, these things are going to be complicated and probably expensive construction projects. Worst of all, you have to build three hulls. If you've built even one boat, you know that one hull can be more than enough work. No problem. Let's just drop down to two hulls and put the rig in the center. That makes a catamaran, which are as common as a midlife crisis. Still, if you're aiming for high performance under sail, these cross beams are really loaded up. Even worse because you have the compression of a tall rig in the middle of the forward cross beam and you still have to build two big hulls. That's why I'm interested in proas. Let me reel off the advantages. First of all, you get trimaran and catamaran-like stability and speed. You only have to build one big hull and one little hull. It costs less and it takes less time. Second, with the rig mounted in the big hull, dynamic loads on the cross beams are much lower. Instead of pressing a hull harder and harder into the waves as the wind gets stronger, the little hull lifts out. The stresses are nicely balanced between the mast, cross beams, and shrouds, and the proa accelerates rather than disintegrating. Third, it's been suggested that one reason westernized proas are so close-winded is that they have a remarkably easy motion under sail. Because they're essentially stabilized monohulls, you don't have that jerky motion going through waves that catamaran and trimaran sailors talk about. This keeps the flow attached to the sails, keeps the speed up, and keeps the crew comfortable. At least as comfortable as you can be at 15 knots or more. Now, it's not all perfection, or we'd all be sailing proas. Proas have the smallest interior space for their length of any multi-hull sailboat, so don't count on an ensuite head in the master stateroom. And of course, there is that peculiar proa geometry, the need to keep the little hull on the windward side at all times. That means you have to exchange bow for stern when you tack, so the boat has two bows and two rudders. And tacking is kind of strange. Still, far too much is made of this asymmetry. Once you're actually out of your armchair and sailing a proa, the maneuver isn't any more or less exciting or difficult than tacking a monohull with a big overlapping jib. 
I designed my Pro with the indispensable input, Russell Brown, who has accumulated more sea miles in westernized Pros, like this one, than anyone alive. Actually, it was a sale on his most recent boat, Jezero, that really got me going on Proas again. Construction started in 2010. I designed the boat to be built out of plywood using very conventional stitch and glue techniques. This kept the cost down and the speed of construction up. Every part of the boat was cut out on Chesapeake Lightcraft's CNC machine. The entire hull was made up in sub-assemblies consisting of flat panels, which were even fiberglass while still flat to save time. Components like the rudders, two of them, one for each end of the boat depending on which tack you're on, were built first and tested in their trunks before the hull was assembled. The main hull is very deep and narrow, so we had to install the trunks before the sides of the hull were added. Once everything was ready, I gathered up some friends and colleagues, and final hull assembly was over with in just a few minutes. The parts snapped together like Legos, and were held in place with the same copper wire stitches that we used to put together 14-foot kayaks. It was cool to see the hull all in one piece after a lot of months of staring at the drawings. From here, it just took epoxy and fiberglass, lots of it, to create a hull that weighed only a few hundred pounds. I've been deliberate in keeping construction simple. It's state of the art for about 1975, which means you don't have to drop a mint of money on carbon fiber, composite core materials, and vacuum bagging supplies. It's just a giant stitch and glue kayak. The hope is that construction is accessible to amateur boat builders on modest budgets. At 31 feet long, madness may be too big for your garage, but you can quickly break down the boat for traveling or storage in your backyard. Total weight, rigged, is about 1,000 pounds. The main hull weighs just about 500 pounds, and the cruising payload is around 1,000 pounds. I chose these dimensions because it's still small enough to be moved around easily and towed on the highway on an $800 trailer with a six-cylinder car. Luckily for me, too, as usual, we ran out of time to finish the boat at Chesapeake Lightcraft, and I sent the unfinished project to be completed by Sea Island Boat Works in Charleston, South Carolina. There, Mark Bain and his crew decked her in, sanded for about a million hours, and sprayed on all grip paint in the most shocking yellow color I could find. The boat's name is Madness, after all, not Circe or Princess Ocean or whatever. The cabin has worked out great. You could really settle in and live out of here for coastal cruising. There's one big berth flat. And two narrower berths, forward and aft. Riding on these rails will be a miniature galley with a stove. With some paint, some cushions, some lights, and ventilation hatches, this is going to be great for cruising on the Chesapeake or in the Bahamas. The boat has cool lines. With almost 400 square feet of sail upwind, this one could startle some much more expensive and pretentious multi-hulls. There is a very conscious nod in the boat's lines to the work of Russell Brown and Dick Newick, who have done so much to inspire sailors and amateur boat builders to get out of the rut of white plastic sloops and condo morans. Well, I've got about a month of rigging and outfitting. We'll see how the boat sails. Stay tuned. I'm John Harris.